On 100.9 WXIR, this is Evidence of Design, and I'm your host, Jason Taylor. I wanted to do something real American about what it's like to live in America around the millennium. And what's that like? It's more like a stomach level sadness. I see it in myself and my friends in different ways. It manifests itself as a kind of lostness. Whether it's unique to our generation, I don't really know. The sadness that the book is about and that I was going through was a real American type of sadness. A lot of my friends were the same way. Some of them were deeply into drugs, others were unbelievable workaholics, some were going to singles bars every night. You could see it played out in 20 different ways, but it's the same thing. I get the feeling that a lot of us have to find a way to put away childish things and confront stuff about spirituality and values. And good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Taylor, host of Evidence of Design. You just heard a modified excerpt from a 1996 interview with David Foster Wallace. Before we begin, I'd like to announce that we have a special guest joining us today, my good friend Kirsten. Hi, everyone. Nice to speak with you, I guess. And my good friend, co-host, Matt Treadwell. Hello. This is our fourth episode of Evidence of Design. We come to you live on air from WXIR Studios on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. You can listen to our past shows on YouTube by searching for the Evidence of Design channel. Also, please do. You can email us throughout the show at evidenceofdesign101 at gmail.com. Again, evidenceofdesign101 at gmail.com. Send us an email throughout the show. We're doing something a little different this week. After spending the last two shows talking about gun violence in America, we've decided to focus on something a little more abstract. And before I tell you what exactly that is, I'd like for us to go and look back at the interview that Matt and I just read from. As I said earlier, this interview was taken in 1996, right after David Foster Wallace released his best-known work, Infinite Jest. For those of us who are unfamiliar, unfamiliar with the work, Infinite Jest is a large novel, it's over a thousand pages, and it's ambitious. Wallace uses those 1,000 pages to craft a memorable cast of relatable characters, all while tackling issues such as happiness, drug addiction, terrorism, sports, entertainment culture, and, above all, what it means to, human be- to be a human being at the turn of the century. I'd like to bring our attention to something that you may have missed in our initial reading. David Foster Wallace was noticing a pervasive type of sadness or lostness. While this sadness manifested in, as he said, 20 different ways, in every case he witnessed, it was, again, as he said, a real American type of sadness. In other words, Wallace believed the sadness he and his friends experienced was unique to America, and American culture at the end of the 20th century. If it was something that could only be felt in America, and so it is safe to assume that something about America was responsible for this, as he put it, stomach-level sadness. For Wallace, much of this sadness had to do with entertainment culture. In Wallace's time in the mid-1990s, this manifested in like television, uh, viewership, and aggressive corporate marketing. However, since Wallace's comments in the mid-1990s, our society has irrefutably become more entertainment-driven. The internet, music and movie streaming services, social media, and companies that target the public with really addictively engineered products and advertising are all have be, all become de facto experiences of our current entertainment culture. So on today's show, we're going to explore and expand upon Wallace's worldview, especially from the lens of a culture that glorifies consumption. And we'd like to start out this discussion by talking, uh, by sort of framing it around maybe four different metrics, four different conversations about the happiness index, addiction, suicide, and also the time spent in America using screens. Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about this thing known as the World Happiness Report? Oh, I'd love to, Jason. So what's the deal with the World Happiness Report? So the World Happiness Report is a survey that's conducted every year. It's been conducted 
since 2012, um, where 156 countries around the globe are surveyed on six basic values, and those are uh, GDP per capita, social support, healthy life expectancy, social freedom, generosity, and absence of corruption. Now, the latest, the 2018 report just came out this month, actually. Um, I believe it was released two weeks ago. And um, the Washington Post actually ran a lovely breakdown on the report. Um, Some interesting things to take away from it are that the U.S. was ranked 18th this year, again, out of 156 countries. Um, The U.S. ranked 14th last year, so we are down four spots. Four spots. We're four spots less happier in 2018, or I guess in 2017, than we were in 2016. And... um, since the survey began in 2012, the U.S. has actually never been in the top 10 spot. Um, interestingly, the happiest countries tend to be are commonly Nordic countries such as Norway, which was first this year, Finland, which was second, and first last year, uh, Denmark, which was third, Sweden, which was fifth. And um, if I might, I'd love to read a little excerpt from the Washington Post article. Yeah, and let me just jump in real quick, Matt. It, it, it may sound awkward to listeners that were like a happiness index, how you measure happiness. Sure. We can develop metrics and index indices to measure all, all kinds of things. And so I, I'm curious to know exactly what the happiness index measures. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, six different sort of variables that, that is measured throughout that. It is it is. Interesting enough, though, at least the, the trend that, okay, this started in 2012 and the U.S. has been has ranked less happy since or 2012. And we'll talk a little bit more about perhaps uh, what sorts of things you, you can measure as a society. And if happiness is one of those things, how can you measure that and how does that manifest? So, yeah, I mean, a lot of this information was reported in the Washington Post and elsewhere. And this one particular Washington Post article had some interesting things to say. Obscenity, substance abuse, including opioid abuse, and depression offset the happiness that often comes with the kind of economic growth the United States has seen since 1972, the report said. Those factors contribute to a drop in life expectancy at birth nearly unprecedented for a high-income country in peacetime. Corporate lobbying and deregulation have allowed pharmaceutical companies to drown the country in opioids, and high medical costs curb the ability for many people to seek treatment for depression, the report said. But more issues are at work in the United States. Social support networks in the U.S. have weakened over time. Perceptions of corruption in government and businesses have risen over time. And confidence in public institutions has waned, the report said. And let's pause right there. There's a lot that was in that. So obesity, substance abuse, and depression offset the happiness that often comes with a type of economic growth seen in the United States. So in the United States and around the world, really, the the most common way to measure perhaps success as a nation is through something called GDP, which is gross domestic product. And GDP is essentially like what is the value of everything? What is the monetary value of everything society produces in a given year? However, what you just read, Matt, is that social support networks in the U.S. have weakened over time. Perceptions of government corruption, uh, perceptions of corruption in the government and businesses have risen over time, and confidence in public institutions has waned. So those are sorts of things that GDP doesn't necessarily pick up. Like doesn't GDP measure. Doesn't measure. Because how could GDP measure things such as literacy levels or childhood mortality, health care? Or the opioid epidemic. Exactly. So you can put monetary values in all these things. But interestingly, when you measure these problems with a different lens, such as the Human Development Index, so there are people out there in the world who argue that we as a society and as a culture should be measuring our success in different ways than GDP, such as a metric called the Human Development Index. And that is an index that takes into account GDP but also includes things that we as a society would hopefully like to have value and value. So the report goes on to say that oddly enough in in Latin America, they have less economic perhaps uh, strength as the U S but they're somehow happier, happier. I, 
I don't think that all in all Latin American countries rank above the U.S. in this report because again the U.S. ranked 18th out of 154th. But the point is, is like when you when you correlate those two things, the, the, here's the point: economic success does not equate to happiness. Right, overall. It doesn't always translate. Exactly, it's not pure correlational causation, and that's a really important point that I think. Uh, sort of <laughs> warrants looking into a little bit more. I actually have a quote from uh, the co-editor of the World Happiness Report, uh, John Hellowell. He wrote that, um, or he said last year, quote, it's the human things that matter. If the riches make it harder to have frequent and trustworthy relationships between people, is it worth it? The material can stand in the way of the human. And that's him speaking about the role of income and GDP in regards to happiness. Absolutely. So I think that it's definitely safe to say that money helps. Money helps to get people to be happy because you need to have like your basic provisions provided for. Sure. However, at a certain point, perhaps the the sort of the return on the return on the money. <laughs> well, it's not the only thing that matters, is it? Mm. Well, and you guys mentioned the whole su- support system thing, and you look, you mentioned Jason already, the Latin American countries, and a lot of those countries value have a lot of core values of family and. Not just your immediate family, but those big extended family units. Um, and that can be seen in a lot of other countries, not, not so much in the United States. So you lose that support system that, that obviously plays largely into that, that happiness index. Your family is going to theoretically make you happier. So having those things, I know a lot of Latin American countries still have their, uh, siestas and their, you know, hour long plus lunch breaks to actually spend that time with their families and with, people who make them happy and have that support so it's not just one individual facing the world absolutely so it's a there's a cultural component to to happiness that is found uh, definitely beyond just baseline academic or (laughs) academics uh, economics and i i think that we do see that in latin american countries you mentioned in terms of uh, they're more family oriented and I, i think it's safe to generalize that in the united states we're largely individualistic and maybe career-oriented population? I would say, at the very least, that that emphasis is felt in society. There's an importance to being self-sufficient. There's an importance to being career-minded. There's an importance to being to to finding success on your own. That's kind of wrapped up in the whole idea of the American dream, I would say. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And so there's a quote also from the uh, the article from the Washington Post that talks about this uh, world happiness index that we're talking about. And it comes from economist Jeffrey Sachs. Sachs is notable as an economist for really working to redefine what success means in, in the world and in societies. Sachs has worked a lot on things such as the Human Development Index. He's one of the guys pushing that. One of the guys pushing that. And, and, and Sachs writes that... America's declining happiness is a social crisis, not an economic crisis. He writes that this American social crisis is widely noted, but it's yet to be translated into public policy. Almost all of the policy discourse in D.C. centers around, here. here's this point, naive attempts to raise the economic growth rate as if a higher growth rate would somehow heal the deepening divisions and angst in American society. He argues that this kind of growth-only agenda is wrong-headed. This is a pretty important point because I think that most of the rhetoric you hear, well, at least it's common to, to see politicians standing behind a podium or whomever else talking about the economy, the economy, the economy. I, I'm i not sure that the average American actually knows what the economy is. And I'm included in that group because... Yeah, the, me too. Yeah, absolutely. Because the economy is not this like tangible thing that you walk into a room and it's a bunch of flips and levers that you can move up and down and, you know, here's our economy. Well, it's not even something that people... I mean, at least from my experience, typically talk about. It's not like we, or if it is talked about, it's always in a sort of general way. It's like, oh, the economy's down. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. we're in recession. But and a lot of the time, people just refer to the economy as you know the stock market. Stock market's not doing good, so the economy must not be doing well, which you know could be true in some cases, but not not necessarily. There's other the other factors, excuse me, that go into this whole concept of the economy as a whole. Mm-hmm. I'm really testing my knowledge here. I think it's like 
slightly more than 50% of Americans actually are invested in the stock market. And then two thirds of all of the wealth in the stock market is owned by like the top 5% of the wealthiest individuals. So the stock market is really a reflection of the wealthiest people. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yes. And you know, the stock market is doing so well right now. Um, Good for them. Yes. But the, the point is the economy actually does have a direct relationship at times to like happiness in society. I mean, if we go back to the 2008 global financial crisis, that was a big deal. You know, millions of people lost their jobs. Absolutely. And it, it's really quite devastating. And, you know, we can do a whole episode of how that how that crisis started. Um, but the rhetoric, so the rhetoric since the 20, 2008 global financial crisis, I think that as a society we are still trying to sort of wrestle with our recovery from that. I argue my hypothesis is that the 2016 presidential election was still an election about our response to the 2008 global financial crisis because a re the rhetoric used very effectively by Donald Trump is like, this country is a mess and we have still not recovered. Our economy is a mess. People are taking our jobs. And I think people felt that and uh, captured that narrative. And there's lots of reports out now from, you, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, whomever, that the economy is doing great. And they'll say buzzwords like the economy is humming, the economy is buzzing along, yeah. the economy is strong. And I don't know as an American, I definitely felt it, even though I was young in 2008, I definitely felt that downturn. I don't know if as an American I've felt the economy get stronger in the past four or five years. I'm not sure that that translate that direct that directly. Perhaps if you are really wealthy and invested, then you've definitely seen the economy grow because since Trump was elected, stocks have uh, historically risen to to really high heights. And of course, Trump has claimed success for that recovery, but uh, obviously the facts show for responsibility. Responsibility, yeah. Trump has claimed responsibility for the economic success that we supposedly have right now. Of course, though, the recovery has been happening for the entirety of the Obama administration. And if you look at like different graphs of however you want to measure economic success, we've been increasing steadily. And you know, I think you could have put any of the candidates who ran in 2016 in the presidential seat and the economy would have still done fairly well <laughs> in terms of how we Probably. are now. So well, that... Yeah. yeah, go for it. Just one thing I'd like to mention. Is I think we do have, uh, certainly we have economic issues in this country. Um, and it, it's certainly like the the source or cause for a lot of people's sort of NUI or uh, depression. But I, I would argue that the answer is not that we need more growth. I think the the problem is not that we don't have enough growth. I think the problem is that we have widespread inequality in the system. Like you said, uh, we don't have the actual numbers, but I'm fairly certain you're familiar enough to make the claim that, like, what, two-thirds of all the money in the stock market is owned by 5% of the population? It's Yeah, I, I do not do not take that and put it on your fridge and write with it, you know, but that's definitely a, the picture. It's mm -hmm. like in that ballpark, yep. at the very least, and that's insane. Mm -hmm. When there are people in this country living on food stamps or, you know, serving their families unhealthy food just to get by, that... America does not have like a, an economic growth problem. It has an inequality problem. Yeah, America has a moral problem in terms of how it actually values the distribution of wealth and income in society. There is more than enough food to go around. There's more than enough wealth to go around. There's more than enough income to go around. It's just that it happens that it's all concentrated in, in really small sectors of society. And that's been happening for the past 40 years. We live in a more economically unequal time today than uh, this country has seen since right before the Great Depression. And our argument, at least my argument, my hypothesis is that this thing that David Foster Wallace was talking about, this stomach level sadness, perhaps manifests in, in society because of the unequal distribution of wealth and income. Not because of the entire pie is so small we need somehow GDP to rise by X percentage points, but because that some people have a lot more stuff than others, and the system is designed such that those small groups of people get more stuff than others. And we should say that what we're arguing for right, right now is not like, I guess, your traditional or sort of taboo view of communism where everybody shares everything equally. It's like not even that we're opposed to like people, some people having more 
because for whatever reason. But the, the, the reality is that very few people have so much more than they'll ever possibly need, than they could ever possibly justify in my eyes. And, and that's just not reasonable. It's not right. It's not morally right. Absolutely. So that was our first of four things we'd like to talk about, just to kind of set the scene and contextualize perhaps uh, this this narrative of perhaps some sort of unique American sadness or this unique American problem in our body politic and civil society about something something's not right. And I think it manifests in many different ways. And, of course, the happiness index is one small narrow way that that manifests, but I think it's worth having a discussion about. There's something else, though, that I think affects all of us in every community across this country that's recent, and that is uh, the opioid crisis, but also the crisis related to drugs in general. So we have a few stats we'd like to share with you. Sure. So um, all of the information I found was from 2016. There's no, like, 2017 info out there yet, as far as I could tell. But anyway, in 2016, um, 42,000 people died from an opioid overdose. That's about 116 people a day. That's a 21% increase from 2015. That's huge. Um, 64,070 people died from a drug overdose. So that takes in the opioid count and the... uh, in, and then other drugs as well. Um, so that's like two thirds. Yeah. Two thirds of people died of an opioid overdose of all drug overdoses in mm-hmm. 2016. Um, might be interested to know that more people died from an o- a drug overdose in 2016 alone, just in that year alone, than all the American soldiers who died in the entirety of the Vietnam War, which was like something like 58,000 soldiers, I believe. That that is an incredible statistic to me, and that, that is insane. That absolutely blows my mind. Like the Vietnam War lasted thirteen years, or something like that, and more people died from drug overdoses. More American citizens died of drug overdoses in 2016 than all of the American soldiers, all of the American casualties in Vietnam. Uh, that's that's something that's interesting uh, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, that's like <laughs> a very like real way to frame that. Yeah, yeah, in one year alone, and I, I believe that these. There have been more overdoses occurring since Absolutely. 2016. Yeah, it's it's interesting to note though that that number, as staggering as it is, has actually decreased. The opioid epidemic reached its peak, hmm. if I remember correctly, around 2012, so right around the same really? time I that, know that yeah that this happiness index started that you've discussed so far. But um, sadly, as as staggering as that number is, that that number is on the decline. So just stop and think about that for, you know, two seconds. That number was higher. You're suggesting that more individuals died from opioid overdoses? Opioids. So that's been going down since 2012? Yep, the opioid Hmm. epidemic is actually decreasing in some some regards. Hmm. Um, Still, obviously, a huge epidemic and a big crisis facing our country nationally, and not just nationally, but at state and local levels as well. Hmm. I'd be interested to look into that. I, I I thought at least that it was increasing over time. That's that was at least my my uh, sense. Well, it might that be that it increased from 2015 to 2016, but yeah. overall it's on a downward trend. Yeah. yeah, it's on a downward trend overall. Yeah, that's interesting. We kind of have to move things a little bit long here. So, <laughs> drugs are uh, overdoses due to drugs are a very uh, real problem, symptomatic and real problem in society. There's also suicide. According to the CDC, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in America, but most importantly for individuals aged 15 to 34, it's the second leading cause of death, right behind sort of accidental injury. It's worth noting, this connects to our second and third episodes last two weeks, that over 50% of all suicides are committed with firearms. So actually, most of the deaths caused by firearms are, are due to suicides. And uh, it's worth noting that men commit suicide 3.5 times more than women. I think that is, um, well, I think if I remember correctly, the, st- the statistic is uh, that women attempt suicide more frequently mm. than men, but men uh, are more often successful because they tend to use more dangerous methods such as firearms. Hmm. That is interesting. And then uh, this is all coming from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, by the way. And uh, it's, it's worth noting that white males accounted for 70% of all suicides in 2016. And Most of those men are middle-aged. Yeah, middle-aged white males, which this, again, calls into question the idea of economics and happiness. And, I, I mean, you would imagine that... The most privileged sort of demographic in America 
is also the one that commits suicide the most frequently. Yeah. And again, th- th- this is uh, it's probably not even worth saying this because I don't want to construct a false narrative, but it is worth noting, as we mentioned in the last few episodes, that in terms of mass shooters, a lot of mass shooters appear to be white and it seems it's middle an class. Over- overwhelming majority. And, uh, yeah, it seems that way. It seems that way. And, and that's just an interesting thing to investigate. Like, w- what is going on there? If, you know, if, if these people are the most privileged in society, what is what could be driving those statistics? I mean, obviously there are simply more white, men white people in in, the country. in America, yeah, absolutely than other than other demographic groups. But um, yeah, that is definitely interesting. And the very last thing we'd like to talk about. So we have the we have this sort of to recap, everyone. You are listening to Evidence of Design here at WXIR 100.9 FM. You can email us throughout the show at Evidence of Design 101 at gmail dot com, and we're really talking about. Is there in America this sort of uh, this sort of rhetoric or, or this feeling of of a sadness or lostness as a result of a culture of consumption? So, as a society that is engineered towards economic growth and consumption, is there something going on that might produce this friction in society that causes people to feel feel sad or lost, or have other externalities, other effects, such as uh, high you know deaths due to drug overdoses, suicide, and maybe you know, slipping indices on the human uh, happiness report, <laughs> the world happiness report. The last thing that will connect all the dots and we'll kind of spend the rest of our time today talking about this is the entertainment culture that David Foster Wallace wrote so much about. So for those who haven't read Infinite Jest, David Foster Wallace in that book wrote a lot about the entertainment culture in America that really, as mentioned, manifested through TVs and just sort of corporate ads at his time. Wallace was writing in the mid-90s at a time before there was the Internet, before there was Netflix, before there was Hulu, before there was all the sort of uh, popular culture video games. Before there was games, YouTube, before there was Twitch, before there was... All of that. Before there was all of that. And so... Facebook. <laughs> right, before social media, too. So I would argue we are in an irrefutably more entertainment-driven culture than even in Wallace's time. Even just 20 years ago. Even just 20 years. And w- we're wondering what effect that has on how how we as a society relate to each other, how we engage with one another, and how we feel about ourselves and each other in a society. And so the last thing we'd like to sort of connect the dots with everything is about screen time. It's our use of information technology for the purposes of entertainment. And we have a, a, some st- sh- uh, stats to share about screen time. So all the info I found was from the Nielsen report. They do a quarterly reports where they uh, sort of survey how much time pe- Americans are spending on their devices. Um, the number I got was between, between 10 and 12 hours. The uh, I, I referenced a CNN article, and in that article, the Nielsen report said 10 hours and 40 minutes a day. Or, let me rephrase that. Americans spend 10 hours and 40 minutes a day on some sort of screen. So that could be a phone a TV, a tablet, a computer, whatever. Um, the latest report that I was able to find, which was from uh, quarter two of 2017, said that the hour or the time has increased to 12 hours and seven minutes. So it's a, around the 10 to 12 hour range. Um, that latest report also said that about 81% of adults in the U.S. now have smartphones. And they spend about an hour and 39 to 40 minutes on average, consuming media on that smartphone. 94% of adults now have an HD television, and the average adult spends about four and a half hours every day watching shows and movies. And, and this is probably perhaps the most interesting thing, the uh, sort of growth and ubiquity of streaming services now. At least 50% of American households now subscribe to some sort of streaming service, which could be like Netflix or Hulu, Amazon Video, anything like that. And that, num- that number is also the same for the number of households that have a DVR to record television shows on like cable networks. That's a lot of media consumption. A- the average adult in America spends 10 to 12 hours a day consuming media. Is, I mean, I wonder how they, of course, define consuming media. What is the metric for that? That's, that's a lot. I know that I, most of my job is spent behind a computer. I don't know if that counts as consuming media, whether like you know, Microsoft I don't Excel, think that would. That wouldn't, yeah. Uh, but I do know that I spend a considerable amount of time consuming media. Uh, for good or bad, I feel like I try to read a lot and stay up to date. Yeah. But I don't want to know what my number is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but how many people read on their tablets now? Yeah. I think that would 
count, honestly, because it's it's any sort of like entertainment. It's reading. It's music. It doesn't have to be something that you watch necessarily. Mm-hmm. So what I find most fascinating about this is like we are literally the first humans in the ex- history of human humanity. <laughs> First humans in the history of humans is that My statement. <laughs> <laughs> that we uh, information technology is I think fundamentally reshaping who we are as a species, and we won't really know the effects of this until down the line. But maybe not I, even in our lifetimes. Yeah, I am. I, I think we all in this room who are talking to you right now are one of the last generations of people who were born before the internet ish. Sort of remember a time when it wasn't as prevalent as it is now yeah. when you think back to elementary school we didn't learn to type and mm-hmm. that that's one of the first things kids are learning cursive is going out the window yeah mm-hmm. i'm definitely i wonder what it's like to be born nowadays and grow up with everything here um i, I don't know i don't know how that feels and how, how that shapes your worldview and this is important because you know, I'm just postulating right now. I actually haven't thought about this that much. There's something called neuroplasticity. It's a recent sort of, uh, I would say, discovery. A lot of research about it right now, at least in education and psychology. And neuroplasticity essentially states that you, your brain changes over time. That may not sound that uh, well, <laughs> like a big discovery, but connections in your brain, mm-hmm. and that's primarily how learning occurs, I believe. Absolutely. So there's neurons in the brain, and they change and shape and fire differently, and that's kind of how cognition works. A very scientific uh, rendition. Let me break this all down for you folks on neuroplasticity, right? Uh, I'm not a We're science experts. guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but the, the idea is that our brain changes over time, and people... This is somewhat new because people used to think, well, you know, your brain kind of stops developing at X age, and that's kind of all there is to it, and, you know... I believe there are. are still people who think that, so it's not mm-hmm. like this is... Uh, accepted as scientific canon Mm -hmm. for lack of a better term but yeah Mm -hmm. the point is for drugs and and information technology use though is i wonder how that reshapes our brains like to my knowledge drugs literally remap your brain so i actually read an interesting book um about a guy who was a drug addict and he actually went into neuroscience once he was again sober and looked exactly like that and you know, I'm no science person here by any means, but all sorts of different chemicals that influence your moods and, you know, dopamine and all sorts of things like that. And drugs have a very, very severe impact on how your brain actually adapts and changes. So your brain does change for drugs and it doesn't change just when you're using drugs, but it changes for the duration of your life, which limits, you know, what you can and can't do, how you feel happiness, how certain things change in your brain. So, so it, for addicts, it is a very real change that occurs for them. Mm-hmm. And I, I wonder if there's research out there now about, because we know that happens for drugs, I wonder if there's anything out there about the effects of this phenomenon with our use of screen time or social media. I know that Matt and I, as we talk sometimes, uh, you've said that it's harder to read read a book nowadays, like to read a novel. My attention span is severely reduced. Mm-hmm. And I used to sort of scoff at that maybe five years ago. This whole like millennial generation has no attention, and I still sort of scoff at that in a way. I, I don't think that's a fair. I don't think that's a fair treatment of an entire generation of people. However, I do think that I, I might be experiencing this, experiencing this myself too, where it's like, you know, I, I did read Infinite Jest one thousand pages last summer, two summers ago, and, and it was an awesome experience. But I, I have a fundamentally harder time reading long novels than I used to. And because I always know that I can just plug into YouTube and get a dopamine hit for a 10-minute video, which turns into a two-hour watching session, you know? Yes, I I, I mean, I've sort of been saying that, what you just talked about, like, oh, I can't read a book anymore, as a, as a joke. Um, and I think there are other things as well that sort of influence my difficulty these days in consuming, like, large narrative works. I think part of the reason why, I mean, I was always, I remember growing up, I was always reading a book, but honestly, the books that I were interested, I was interested in as a child are much easier to read than the books I'm interested in mm-hmm. now. And I don't want to discount, like, the role that that plays in sort of, you know, perhaps dissuading me from, like, oh, I'd really like to read The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, but I could just watch YouTube for an hour and mm-hmm. probably feel at least in the moment, just as satisfied. Of hmm. course, afterwards, I'm left feeling empty inside. Yeah, you feel worse. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, though. I mean, 
uh, often I turn to either video games or YouTube or some sort of electronic media uh, in terms of, to like wind down, to decompress. And sometimes that And I actually, think that's important. Mm-hmm. I think that like it's not that these things need to be, you know, discarded entirely. I think it is important to have time to to not think and to sort of enjoy something silly or dumb. It's all about the balance of it, though. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you should be able to sit down and read a book and, you know, put the phone away for, you know, an hour, even just a half hour just to focus on one thing. You think about, you know, smartphones. They're sitting next. I mean, as I'm sitting here right now, my phone is sitting out in front of me. No, I'm not on it right now. You're in the room with us now. <laughs> I'm in the room with them now, and my phone is still sitting out in front of me. And, you know, you think about when you're you're doing something. I mean, I'm guilty of this myself. I'm sitting there reading a book, and, you know, my phone lights up, and it's uh, Snapchat. Yeah, I'm going to look at that Snapchat. It's I want to see exactly what that is. And I think it's a conscious effort that people have to make sometimes to say, let me step back from this. Let me not use my phone for that first hour when I wake up in the morning, which studies have shown is super important. And, you know, when people wake up first thing in the morning and look at their phone, that's actually a sign of addiction. Mm -hmm. If you can't go without looking at your phone, you're just as addicted as, you know, people who are sometimes addicted to drugs. It's got to be in your hand, in your pocket. So Mm -hmm. and I think that is a perfect opportunity to transition into the article that sort of served as the impetus for the, this week's episode. Absolutely. And then I would add one more point before we do that, though, in that, of course, everything we talk about, we like to create, a, uh, connect it back to the larger economy. It's worth noting out that there are large industrial complexes that produce the drug problem, that produce addiction. Uh, for decades, the tobacco industry lied about the harmful effects of tobacco. <laughs> Not that they didn't know about it. They knew about it. They lied to the public about it. Ended up costing us, if you want to put a monetary value on it, billions of dollars and lots of lives. There's also... Also lots of lives. <laughs> yeah, I know, right. If you Like, what's more important, you know? Um, but there's also with social media, there are companies out there right now that are working with psychologists to figure out what is the most addictive way possible to get you to engage with their product or service. Sure. Matt and I are huge gamers, and we're hoping to do some episodes on gaming uh, from a from a particular point of view that I think we can have a lot of interesting discussion about. But the, the idea is that you see this all the time now in the modern video game industry where you the video games are not sort of constructed as an experience anymore, something that you can get something out of and really explore. It's just, it's just constructed as a time to capture your attention as much as possible. And the more attention you give it to it, the more money they make. And maybe maybe popular media does this. CNN, uh, MSNBC, Fox News. I I don't know. Um, but the, you know, I'm really trying to wrestle with what is this doing to our brains as a society? How do we come to relate with one another when our attention is constantly being barred by hundreds of ads a day that keep us to say, "Look over here, buy this thing." What are we missing out? And I, I think that is producing a type of sadness or lostness that is in our society that Wallace talked about in the mid-90s, but that is also indicative of our current political climate in terms of where we are with partisanship and division and inequality and people using different sets of facts. Because this is all part of a larger industry that is just meant to make money and not meant to actually get people to talk to each other and really uncover hopefully a capital T truth that is meant to get us to all live in a society where we can like collectively make decisions. That's my theory. I'm working on a book. Just that was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to sponsor my, I can't do that. <laughs> sponsor me to write a book that I, okay. Anyways, um, let's move on. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. So we, yes, uh, the, the idea for this show actually came from an NPR article, January 16th, 2018, written by James Jackson Toth. The article is called Too Much Music, A Failed Experiment in Dedicated Listening. The idea behind this article is that the author writes that he is a music fanatic, used to experience music in a particular way for most of his life, and it was a very personal experience. Sacred, I would say. Yeah, it was sacred. It had certain... How would we define sacred? Well, it has like a a ritual-like quality to it. It has um, sort of an importance that transcends perhaps just the activity itself. Hmm. I really like that. Yeah, the notion of the sacred is really quite interesting. So, listeners, you're hearing me actually think. Um, <laughs> not the best radio, <laughs> not the best interesting radio thing to hear someone actually think, but that, that's a cool point. 
So his mu- so Ch- Jackson Toss's experience was sacred to him, and he writes a, a lot about him going into music stores and just loving to buy CDs, like physically buy CDs, experience them, feel them, read the lyrics. Yeah, absorb them entirely. Know who was in the bands, what other bands they played in, the labels that they were on, just sort of the whole the culture behind the music that was created. Definitely. And he writes that this all changed, or started to change when the internet made it possible to share music. You could download MP3s online. Files uh, like, well, websites like Napster, for example. Mm-hmm. And I believe this was an illegal practice, but it was you know, quite common in the early 2000s, if I remember. But nowadays, of course, what had been illegal is now essentially legal and makes companies money, which is sort of streaming services. Like Spotify or Apple Music. Mm-hmm. And so Toth writes, he wrote, this is a, he's really, he's a really talented writer. He wrote, uh, one day there was a revelation. It occurred to me that it was no longer just difficult to hear all the music I'd amassed, but impossible. I mean, literally mathematically impossible. I calculated that if I lived another, say, 40 years and spent every minute of those next 40 years with no sleeping or eating, listening to my collection of music, I would be dead before I could make it all the way through. So Toth is writing about his, all of a sudden, this freedom, this individualistic com- consumer choice to select between all of these different types of music and amass them, all of a sudden changed his relationship to music, and it sort of deadened and flattened the experience for him, such that he couldn't develop that relationship, that sacred relationship with music that he once had before, because there is a simply everywhere, all the time. He writes that modern life, with all this informational density, has rendered filtering out the noise virtually impossible. This is perhaps like, well, and the quote that we have written after that, these, which I should probably just read. Go for um, it. For, I should also say that in the article, uh, Toth briefly talks about how in order to sort of combat um, this growing, or not really growing, but spiraled out of control addiction that he has, because he talks about also like how he would go to record stores and just buy records that he would not ever even put on. He just wanted to have them. Um, as a way to sort of combat that, he uh, devised an experiment for himself where he would listen to just one album a week. And that was sort of his way to try and get back into his original practice of really delving in and divesting himself into a an album. Um Unfortunately, it seems that at least at the time that he wrote the article, the, the experiment was a complete failure. <laughs> and he wrote, um, My arrogance was not in believing I was immune to the way our relationship to music has been irrevocably altered by technology and the occult market forces that engender it, but that I somehow possessed the ability to transcend it by making myself immune. By making myself immune. And that is sort of, I guess, that hits home for me, personally. That's... Like um, what you were talking about earlier, Kirsten, about uh, balancing time between, you know, say your phone and and doing something perhaps a bit more rewarding, like reading a book or or exercising or or getting involved in your community. Um, we still all have that the ability to do that. I think it's just the way that uh, modern life, at least in America, is structured. It becomes nearly impossible to do so because. Is there, like, anybody younger than us who doesn't have some sort of... I mean, younger than us and and older than, say, 12 that doesn't have some sort of presence on social media? Is it possible to, like, exist in a, in a, in what, uh, in a way that's, like, considered normal or, or, or typical in America and not have, like, a Facebook account or a Snapchat account or a Twitter account or a Tumblr account or... An Instagram account. I mean, even before before you hit 12, parents are posting their sure, absolutely. infants on, on social media. So hmm. I don't know if they know how to have a presence because by the time you hit age 12, well, you've pretty much grown up on social media. It's just time for you to get your own account and stop being your parents' hmm. account anymore. So... I know personally I can speak that I use social media as a way to stay connected with friends and also with... Uh, a lot of people in the local music scene, it's a great way to know when shows are being played by my friends. Um, and so I don't think I could 
necessarily just totally remove that from my life and not like feel its absence and, and sort of really struggle with that. At the same time, it's so easy to be, you know, distracted when you're just scrolling through your Facebook page and you're like, oh, like none of this, uh, like probably 90%, and I don't even feel like I'm exaggerating with that number, of the stuff that appears on my Facebook sort of feed. I hate that it's called that. <laughs> but 90% of the stuff that appears on my feed is like stuff that I really don't even need to know or care to see, honestly. I think it's an interesting experiment. I've done this several times um, over the course of me being personally on Facebook. Um, I've actually deactivated my account for periods of time and told myself for, for various reasons, for personal reasons, I need to be off of this. I need to step away from this. And I normally set time frames and time periods and say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be off of this for, for the next month, the next two months, however long. And you feel that draw back to it. You feel that myth, that that um that's what I'm looking for that that loss of not having that like what am I supposed to do what do I look at what do I I'm in an awkward social situation I can't just pull up Facebook on my phone and pretend I look busy (laughs) sure and it's interesting because you go through that for a little bit of of time so you know say maybe a couple weeks and then you start realizing okay I don't miss it to some degree and yes I, I always go back I'm still on Facebook to this day just like you said Matt to keep those connections with people that maybe aren't as close to me as physically as I would like them to be sure but it, it's an interesting experiment to just kind of put yourself through maybe it doesn't have to be that long just say I'm not going to go on Facebook for the next couple of days see how you feel about it because it it really kind of hits home like you guys are saying how ingrained and how addicting and how much is pushed at us through Facebook, social media, or smartphones on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you, you sound a bit exasperated. I'm a little exasperated. <laughs> I think I just I, I keep wondering what is that doing to us as a society, and I I I, I, I need to look up research that's been done on that because I'm curious. And um, well, that's like. That's addiction, isn't it? Yes. That's what I would call it. I think it it. is. And and one of the things I think that is so often misunderstood in at least America is that addiction is a disease. You Mm -hmm. know, it's often treated as something that is a choice, something that people can easily just sort of, you know, remove or divest themselves of if they wanted to. But the reality is that it's really hard. And I mean... You know, if if 81% of people living in America have a smartphone, I think I can reasonably make the claim that if you're sort of uh, wary of the, like how difficult it is to uh, to quit a drug, for example, not to say that you know phone addiction is anywhere near as addictive as something like heroin or even cigarettes, but if you just want to like get a taste of it, try not looking at your phone for three weeks, like mm. three weeks. Try it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you know we should uh, seven days in a week. Let's have Sundays be a phoneless day, no media day. I don't know. I wonder what that would do. I do that too. I do yeah. Mondays. I so try to not look at my phone or my laptop. Yeah, it feels it feels good once yeah. you do it. It's interesting. I think our last point here, because we're running out of time, folks, is that Toth makes an interesting point here that there's a lot of connections to when he writes that missing from the larger discussion is the radical idea that maybe it is the consumers who are being done the greatest disservice to this axis bonanza. So there is an argument that in American society, in our current economic climate, that individual choice, access to markets, freedom, and unfettered market competition, so free market competition, is the best way to run society. This is argu- this is largely the uh, neoliberal agenda. We haven't defined that term yet, although we mentioned it in our very first show. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But the idea is that in American society right now, everything is very much based on this notion of constructing a society based upon economic competition. And that economic competition is always done with the rhetoric saying it benefits consumers. And I might have said before that I'd rather be seen as a human being than a consumer, uh, but ultimately <laughs> those decisions are being made uh, for consumers. And so Toth interestingly writes that it's actually with this access to all of this different media, maybe it's us as the consumers who are who are being hurt because what are we losing out on? 
we're losing out on opportunities to have sacred engagement with things, with other people. Because it's it's no stranger that the easiest way to be happy is to have a lot of connections that mean a lot to you and meet people and get to know them and develop reciprocal relationships like that. Of course, hopefully you have an economic situation that allows you to meet your basic needs. But then once you have that, stuff kind of doesn't matter that much anymore. Was that Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and... That's kind of the basic principle of it. You know, get people after you get your basic survival needs. And I wonder as a society, uh, this rhetoric of consumer choice, I mean, what are we losing out as a society where we were being taught to distrust government and taught to distrust public services? What is happening to us as a society when our very, our very politicians who are elected by us tell us that government is a problem, that government doesn't work, that we need to drain the swamp, that big government is an issue, that we, universal health care is an obscenity, that education should be privatized. What are we losing out as a society when we just sort of, everything has to become this culture of consumption where it's a transactional relationship, tit for tat, one person wins, one person loses. And I, I'm, I'm a little worried about that. And I think that we would be well served to appreciate to appreciate, I guess, to slow down and try to try to maybe using the word sacred again, try to cultivate uh, sacred opportunities by actually getting to fully experience a thing. Slow down. Slow down. Yeah, probably a little bit more to it than that too. Folks, we looks like we are out of time. One very last quick plug. Please do hey register to vote if you get a chance. Register to vote and please do vote. We have, uh, I believe, federal primary elections Tuesday, June twenty sixth. State primary elections Thursday, September 13th, and our general election this year is Tuesday, November 6th, I believe. Please do register to vote if you have not. You can do it in multiple places, but uh, you can do it at the DMV as well, in person or online. Voting is really important. Please do just register to vote, and if you do register, please do vote. Up next is the Jesus Peace Radio, and on at 2 p.m., I believe, is Spilling the Tea with our friends Chaz Martin and Giselle. You've been listening to Evidence of Design here at 100.9 FM WXIR. My name is Jason Taylor, your host of this show, joined today by Matt Treadwell. Hi. And Kirsten. Hey, everyone. Kirsten Chandra. Folks, see you next Saturday. Thanks a lot for listening. Be well, be safe.